Hi, everyone. My name is Nacho Sanguinetti. I'm a scientist at Harvard University. I'm a postdoctoral fellow. And I'm going to tell you some things about this movie, but mostly some things about my work. And I was just reflecting that this movie came out in 2007. And I'm just mesmerized at how many people are here to watch this movie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if you came here to watch the movie to hear me speak. I hope you came here to watch the movie. But I hope uh, with what I'm going to tell you, uh, you can reframe a bit of this movie and, and think about it uh, again, like I did like this week when I watched it <laughs> at home uh, alone. Uh, so th this movie turns out like in 2007, I was a kid. I, I didn't even think I was going to go into science. I was di didn't even think I was going to go into neuroscience. And I didn't think I was going to spend like a large chunk of my life, like 11 years working with rodents and six years working with rats uh, in particular. So you'll see for many reasons this, this movie really is aligned with my work and with some of the things I've done in, in my career. And so it's really my pleasure to be here and to talk to you guys about this movie. So I titled this presentation today, uh, What Rats Can Do. So let me start by giving a content warning. Uh, I'm going to talk about rats. <laughs> Are you all OK? with that? Wow. Okay. I'm going to talk about rats and diseases. So, like, if anybody needs to stand up now, you can stand up and I can give you a hips up once the cartoons start. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to talk about rats. And this sometimes is a triggering topic for a lot of people. A lot of people hate rats for some reasons that we're still trying to figure out and that the New York Times calls me like once a year, we hate rats more than squirrels and that's a thing uh, and we need to know why. Uh, but um, it, it, it really is this, a story of our hatred to rats that, that is like very evident. When we look at this, we go rats, yuck. And let me just start by saying that uh, humans, yuck. <laughs> uh, like rats are just following us everywhere and they're eating our garbage because we dispose of our garbage in a wrong way, because we waste too much food, we could, because we put our waste outside. And, and so they have followed us for like really uh, millennia and and are here to stay, and are here with us. But um, it, it's been like a really long evolving story that we've had with the hatred to rats. And it becomes very evident when you think about the, the Black Death, uh, the second plague of the bacteria called Yersinia pestis, that is a bacteria that is carried in the fleas, and that uh, we blamed for many, many centuries rats for being the carrier or the, of this fleece that killed, devastated a lot of the population of Europe. Uh, and this was in the 1300s. Uh, and it turns out, like, a few years uh, recently, like, some papers have claimed that it was probably Mongolian gerbils that <laughs> brought the fleece in the first place, and then the rats, like, were as much as a victim as the humans. Uh, but... Uh, but it, it, it doesn't stop there. It, it goes even further back in time. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the story of the Pied Piper. The Pied Piper is, uh, is a legend from the, the town of Hamelin in Lower Saxony in Germany, in which they, they had a, a, an infestation of rats, or they were mismanaging their waste system. And they basically hired this fellow with this very colorful coat and, uh, and a flute uh, to uh, literally like play the flute to lure the rats to drown into a river. That's terrible. 
in, in the end of the story, the Pied Piper doesn't get paid by the, the government, as usual, and, <laughs> and ends up like doing something very nasty, which is like uh, playing the flute to the children and the children follow them. Uh, that's pretty bad, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize for that part of the story. The Brothers Grimm did not remove it from the story itself. They love that kind of darkness. But, so we've been trying to kill rats for a really long time, and it's still going. This is an article uh, from the New York Times from 2023. Wanted, New York City rat overlord with a killer instinct will pay $170,000 a year. So this ad was looking for a rat czar to take care of the rat population of New York City. One day I was like uh, at home and I got a call uh, and uh, no, I got an email and it was an email from the New York Times saying like, hey, there's this posting of this job. Do you have any comments? Because we know your uh, uh, rat advocate, or like I'd rather say, a rat advocate, uh, <laughs> and and they sent me the post, and the post said, "Are you bloodthirsty? Uh, do you have a killer instinct for?" And I was like, I, I I answered like, "Is this a prank that the New York Times is making to me right now?" Or do you really want to comment? And it was like, and that, that ended up being like the quote that is right there in the New York Times. Uh, Professor Raffello, who has studied rat behavior, he asked the Times was pranking him. No way this is real, he said via email. It is. Uh, and this is true, true story. It's printed. Uh, and that's exactly what I wrote in my email. So we've been trying to kill uh, rats. And I, 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 I think we should try to manage rats for a very long time. So what I'm going to tell you now is why we shouldn't try to kill rats and why rats are very interesting and very, and very amazing. Uh, so first of all, let me tell you about this movie and why that what I'm going to tell you connects to this movie. Ratatouille, if you haven't seen it, who hasn't seen Ratatouille before? Okay. That's quite, that's quite a few, okay? So Ratatouille is about making bonds and challenging assumptions, and that's not a spoiler, it's in the poster, okay? So that is what this movie is about, and that is what my work has been about. So rats are not only cute, and can be like incredibly cute pets and loving animals, but they also do something that connects us with us, with humans, and with many other animals, which is to play. So rats play. So let me show you how rats play. So let's start with this video. What you will see here is a couple of friends of mine tickling a rat at first, and you will hear some sounds that are ultrasonic and that are the vocalizations or the laughters that the rat is producing while being tickled. And then you'll see the rat chasing the human's hand and also two rats playing together. So let me just show you. So those little squeaks, I'm going to play it again. Those little squeaks you hear are the little laughters of the, of the rat. And you can see how the rat really loves the hand. He's like, where's my hand? Uh, and also, they love to play together. They do this thing that dogs do, that, that kids do, which is this rough and tumble play between each other. So what is play? Play is older than culture, for animals have not waited for humans to, for us to teach them play. <laughs> and there are three types of play. Locomotor play, like has been displayed here, which is figuring out how to move with your body. There's also object play, which is figuring out how to interact with objects in the environment. And finally, there's social play, which is how to interact with other animals. And this is something that transcends species. We can play with a cat, a cat can play with a dog, a dog can play with a rat, a lemur can play with a deer. Uh, and, and they both learn how to interact with each other. The lemur learns that he could grab the horns of the deer, and the deer learns he could headbutt the, the lemur into the air. And we all learn. Uh, 
But the, the important thing is that play is, is really something that has been studied by science because play is incredibly important for the development of children. Play is, is, is like a, a right of the child by the UN Charter and it's important for the development of social and cognitive skills. And this is my, my nephew and niece uh, here demonstrating some of their playing abilities. And, but, but one thing that wasn't very clear is that even though humans have these very basic forms of play that we share with animals, we also have created different forms of play that involve rules, that involve roles, and that involve playing with different mechanisms. So we had these questions, can rats play a game with rules and roles? So we came to the game of hide and seek, one of the oldest games that we know, right? I'm not going to explain hide and seek to you. I hope you all know how it goes. Uh, no, no, it's not peekaboo. Somebody did a peekaboo there. Or this is like when you hide from somebody and then they try to find you. So we came up with this game in which we would let the rat jump into a box. Then we would, in, when the rat was supposed to seek for us, we would close the box. Then we would open it automatically and we would hide behind some opaque covers. And then the rat would search for us, find us. Then we would interact with the rat like tickle it, make it chase the hand, and that was the only reward that we used in this study. There was no food rewards, no water rewards, just the social interaction with the human was enough to teach rats how to play this game. In the other kind of trial, when the rat needs to hide, uh, uh, Annika, who was one of the experimenters here, would like stand next to the open box and count. And then the rat would just run out, look for cover, hide, then be found, and then interact, and then be returned for a new trial. And you might say like, and I was one of the authors of the study here at uh, Sanginete Sheikh, as you know, uh, and the only one that is not in picture, but like in reality here. Um, and you might say like, okay, show me. Okay, here I show you. So this is a rat playing the role of the seeker. So this is how a trial would go. Annika would put the rat in the box, and then she would go hiding. And then once she would go hiding, this will be a very quick trial. The rat will find Annika pretty fast. So you will see the rat at some point peeps out, and then the rat jumps out, and then you'll see like it does a very short trajectory before it sees Annika and then goes straight to Annika. And then they do a little interaction with some tickling, some hand chasing. You'll see some hand chasing now in a second, like uh, the rat will follow Annika's hand uh, here. And so they, they really, this is the only reward that we used to teach them this game. And then Annika would bring them back to the start to try to go for another uh, round of hide and seek. So this, I will show you another one to show you that they really extensively search everywhere for the, for the experimenter. So this one was a harder one because like it chose wrong on the first trial and then started looking everywhere kind of desperately. And then you'll see that the moment like it actually sees Annika, it does a beeline straight to her whoop, and there she goes. So that's the rat playing the role of the seeker. But can rats change role and play the role of the hider as well? Okay, so this is how the hiding would go. So Annika would put the rat in the, in the start box, leave it open, and then count and wait. And then at some point the rat would jump out, look for cover, and hide. <laughs> That's it. And then Annika would pretend like she doesn't know where the rat is for a bit. Uh, we made it very easy for the human here. Uh, and then at some point you'll see the rat peeps out when she sees that Annika passed and then she com the rat comes back in and then it gets the interaction, the same kind of interaction again. They do this little play game and it comes in and out and then Annika brings it back into, into the start box as you'll see in a second. And I'm gonna show you another trial so that you can see how, how extensive this behavior can be. So the rat jumps out, does a partial hide, then goes and hide. Annika goes and get the rat, 
the rat hides again. <laughs> so in, in this way, we kind of showed that the rat was not only enjoying the reward itself, but also enjoying being part of the game that we had proposed to it. So I hope with that I can tell you something about what rats can do. And, and, and rats can do a lot of other things. Rats are incredible social beings that live in large colonies, as we know, and that do a lot of amazing things. For example, rats tell each other like about their food preferences. When a food is like good, they just sniff it into each other and they can tell if something is safe to eat or not safe to eat. They, they, they do amazing things. Um, they can make incredible decisions. They navigate incredible spatial uh, places. Like you can imagine, like they navigate the subway better than us. And, and like here's another example of something amazing rats can do. Rats can help each other. So this is an experiment done in the University of Chicago by a researcher called Peggy Mason. And this rat, one rat is trapped inside kind of like a box and the other rat opens this thing and, and then you'll see that they'll kind of interact and then they'll inspect the thing and then they'll follow each other for a bit and go in and out. <laughs> and, and this time, the first time it took 25 minutes but after like 12 repetitions it, it would take less than a minute that the rat would let the other rat get out. So rats can do really amazing thing. They're this very incredible creature that can develop social bonds between themselves and with humans. And so both my work and this movie uh, is about challenging what rats can do. And, it w and challenging most of all how we think about somebody, how we think about an animal, about what are the things that they're capable of. And so this kind of work is essential to understanding like our social bonds and their social bonds. And with that, enjoy the movie. Thank you.